what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about what you need to do to end-to-end -end test your Java application and kind of everything that's involved in there. Now, that's a lot of stuff to do in an hour. So we're gonna to touch upon a few things. I'm only gonna show you a little bit of product, but I'm gonna be more focusing on how all of these things kind of plug together. Um, and then I'm gonna give you some reading material. I'm gonna point you in some directions of our online resource center. I'll point you to some previous webinars and we'll go from there. So let's kind of start with a very obvious statement. Software is complicated and it's getting more and more complicated. Um, you know, if we look at the, uh, the, you know, generally how applications have been structured, there's an increase in complexity um, with many, many systems that are outside of your control. Um, really, you know, the, the concept of microservices that many organizations are moving towards actually does introduce another layer of complexity where you have systems um, of systems and trying to figure out how can we test those and isolate those um, in such a way that so we can realize the, the true value of microservices, um, let alone the external systems that I have or already constraints with or I have a dependency upon like a mainframe or some kind of external third party. So my systems are increasing in complexity as I'm adding more functionality, and we've got a general push within the industry towards Agile. I mean, really, this has been universally accepted that it's it's a good practice. It helps us deliver better products to the market. Uh, certainly at Parasoft, we do leverage Agile heavily ourselves, and we've kind of evolved over the years. You know, when I first joined Parasoft about 13 years ago, uh, we were kind of more in a traditional kind of iterative development cycle. Um, now we're heavily oriented around a scrum methodology. Um, but the problem that I see in many organizations is that this push for agile is actually being missold within the organizations. It's actually being pushed as faster, faster time to market. It's actually not. It's actually more accurate delivery to market. And the whole point of Agile, meaning that I do lots of iterative releases so that I can kind of change the direction as I go. Um, so, but that being said, many kind of senior executives within the uh, within organizations hear faster time, they hear more releases, they go faster time to market. So it's a, there's a big push around kind of going faster and, and DevOps is often presented as the panacea, it's the answer. It, it's, it's how you can take all of this complexity and make it agile and make it go faster. Um, but faster doesn't mean better. So what you have to be able to do is you have to plug all of these things together and you, you need to use testing to ensure that you can achieve quality. The challenge that we face within organizations is testing while it's seen as the gate and the quality and, and the, the thing which can ensure that we have uh, checked that we've got a quality application is often seen as a bottleneck to the software development process. It's seen as a bottleneck to the DevOps initiative, which is required to be able to implement agile. And um, so it's often kind of focused on in a negative light. The question is, how can we turn testing actually from or move it from being a problem to it being the solution? And there's actually a lot of people that are talking about this already. Continuous testing is the terminology that's used. Um, uh, Diego from Forrester, um, we actually did a webinar with him last week. He's got a blog post here that I'm referencing. Um, talks about continuous testing, actually, in, in my opinion, in the right way. Many people look at continuous testing as just being a simple kind of bridge step between uh, delivery and deployment. Really, it's an integrated part of your entire DevOps process. Um, we actually did a, a joint webinar last week um, all around Agile, DevOps, and continuous testing, so I'm not going to repeat too much of that content here today, but I will actually reference you um, to uh, the recording of that webinar, which is actually available on our resource center on the website. Um, and in that, we talk about how um, DevOps is critical to realize the uh, benefits of Agile and continuous testing is critical to ensure that you have an effective DevOps process. Now, if we think about DevOps 
Uh, many people define that different ways, so I'll just give a, a, a my definition of it. For me, DevOps is all about removing the bottlenecks, make it, taking what I would otherwise be doing manually or with a long, laborious sequence of automated steps and streamlining it, making it not only fully automated, but making it so it can be run at any time and taking out any of the steps that take a long time and kind of optimizing it so we're only doing what we need to be able to do. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus on that overall message today, but mapping it specifically to uh, Java testing of our applications. So something that I'm gonna reference um, as, as my kind of blueprint today is the uh, continuous testing uh, test pyramid. Uh, Martin Fowler uh, first introduced this several years ago. Um, it really is very well uh, understood. You know, many people reference it. Um, certainly, uh, it's one which you'll, you'll when you watch the the other webinar recording, you'll see that we reference it here as well or there as well. Um, and the focus of this is is um, how you should organize your testing practice. And the point here is organizing your testing practice so you can seamlessly integrate it into your DevOps process so that you can ensure that you've got a, a, a reliable quality application. And I break this down into three steps. The first step is minimizing the number of late cycle UI driven um, uh, tests, or uh, brittle UI driven tests um, of the application. Um, there are two reasons you focus on those or, or focus on reducing those. Firstly, it's because they're brittle. When the UI changes, the test breaks, so you spend a lot of time in test maintenance, um, especially if you're um, kind of doing them at the end of the cycle, that problem is becomes you, you end up with a lot of broken tests that you have to maintain and update at the end of your life cycle or the, at the end of the process before you go to release. Um, and that in itself is a challenge as well, because what you're not doing is you're not finding the problems um, you know, close to when they're being injected. So it really becomes a, a, a constraining factor when it comes to accelerating the deliveries and enabling uh, DevOps. However, they still are very valuable. Um, and in fact, actually, I would argue that manual testing is still a key component of most organizations' testing strategy, uh, but the focus of it becomes different. The focus of manual testing moves away from uh, running through a complete uh, regression test suite and focuses more on the things that do require some human insight. So things like exploratory testing, where I'm looking at parts of my application that have been changed and trying to kind of dig out and mine uh, for particular challenges or maybe unknown defects but also user experience uh, testing as well. So there are some tools out there that can help you with uh, UI, UX automation, um, but really the nothing, nothing comes close to the insight that a human being or a domain expert can have by just simply using the product. However, having those as a foundation for my testing suite really doesn't help when I'm trying to kind of do everything continuously and I'm doing kind of millions of releases uh, or, or maybe hundreds of releases uh, a, a month or a day. So the next layer down um, is to actually be one of the, the key areas where certainly we've been seeing people focus for a number of years now at Parasoft. So focusing at creating a set of highly automatable, continuously executable API tests. So focused at testing the core business logic at your REST API, your SOAP service, or, or even um, over uh, protocols such as MQ or JMS. Focusing on this layer really enables you to build a test suite that, as I said, can be run continuously, can be leveraged at each stage of your continuous delivery pipeline to validate the quality gates as you're moving forward. So investing in this area is a key component for testing and validating your Java application to ensure that it meets the, the quality constraints um, and uh, making sure that it, it validates all of the functionality. At the bottom of the pyramid, um, and really where most organizations should be starting, uh, we'll talk about that in a second, is establishing a solid foundation of early stage unit tests. Um, 
you know, we've seen, you know, unit testing is not a new practice. Um, certainly test-driven development. Um, I've seen many organizations uh, go through attempts to deploy that um, with varying levels of success and various this kind of a spectrum of implementation for sure. Um, but that foundation is really what the, the best point of early stage validation of the code base, um, making sure that we can tie um, code level unit tests back to some kind of business requirement so that we can validate that we're functionally uh, uh, doing the correct, uh, the, the correct type of testing. So this is kind of this is the blueprint. We're going to go through how we can attack these different layers, um, and we're going to talk about you know how we can build this testing suite, but also how we can optimize it. But before I go further, there's there's something that I would propose is actually missing from this pyramid, and it's something which really most organizations are doing. Um, you know, unit testing. I could argue that most organizations are somewhat attempting. The the, the breadth isn't there. Um, but certainly something that most organizations are doing at some form is through the, order, the use of automated code analysis. Using this right at the early stages of the software development process, right when the developer writes the first line of code to ensure that you're kind of helping to uncover uh, potential problems that exist within the code base and preventing injecting or kind of layering on top of uh, bad development practices. Now, many organizations uh, will leverage some kind of open source frameworks for this when you're doing Java development. Uh, Sonar Cube is a very popular uh, technology there. What I would kind of counter with that is actually what you, you know, to, to get kind of the basic um, value out of code analysis is, is pretty straightforward to do with open source tools. But there's a whole bunch of additional benefit that you're missing by just leveraging open source frameworks. So uh, Parasoft JTest, for example, um, being obviously our uh, product for assisting with Java developers uh, from the point of view of static analysis and from unit testing, has over a thousand static analysis rules for uh, Java developers, focused on really three types of analysis. These three types of analysis can help me both prevent problems, so help me, as I said, ensure that my foundation of my code that I'm layering technology on top of is solid, but also actually detect bugs within the code by analyzing the execution paths. Now, all of this kind of combined with metrics information so I can understand what parts of the code base are poorly structured, or what parts of the code base are actually well structured, and using this as data that really is uh, gives me a foundation for the for the pyramid to sit upon. Um, and as I said, this practice is very well applied within most organizations. However, it's not being as effectively leveraged because the types of analysis that you're doing um, are typically you know, somewhat basic. But once you've got over that hurdle of actually getting the adoption of the practice, why not simply ratchet it up and go deeper and provide more additional data points? So that is, that's my first foundation. And that's the piece that, that I often feel that organizations somewhat forget when they're looking at the testing pyramid. But let's kind of go and look at the next level up, really the, the area where where I talk to people many times when they're when they're talking about continuous testing, and usually the one of the first places that they want to start is, or the first place that they get somewhat embarrassed about what they're not doing, is is around unit testing. And the challenge here is how do I build that solid foundation of unit tests? Um, and there are numerous reasons why. In fact, most organizations that we see um, have a, a um, you know more of an ice cream cone than a pyramid because they've been focused on those later cycle UI tests. But over the years, what we've been talking to is we've kind of been able to distill down the the reasoning behind that kind of lack of uh, a solid unit testing foundation. Um, the first thing is you want to ask about how what people actually feel? What do they really think about unit testing? And in many cases, when we are kind of, you're talking with developers or, or e even uh, in some organizations now with the adoption of Scrum, 
uh, we're seeing organizations leveraging order, test automation engineers for doing early stage unit testing or uh, kind of leveraging um, the, those, those uh, you know, folks that are not part of the core development team, but to create unit tests sitting side by side with uh, the developers in a kind of a pair programming uh, mode. Um, and often folks don't really have a good uh, feeling <laughs> uh, when they think about unit testing. They usually feel that it's going to be a painful experience um, I'm either I've got a whole backlog of things that I'm going to have to do, um, or I'm actually walking into a room where this stuff is wasn't my mess that was created, but now I'm the one that's responsible for you know kind of tidying it up and putting some order um, around this chaos. Um, so what we've done is we've we've kind of boiled this down to three challenges. Um, and when we are you know, talking with customers, we can usually find that the challenges that they're facing are falling into these three buckets, depending upon their maturity level. Now, the first is that quite frankly, the time that it takes for a non-expert software developer uh, to create a unit test is, um, it's it's very time consuming and it's very complicated. Um, uh, trying to make sure that you're leveraging your mocking and your stubbing frameworks correctly, um, making sure that you're exercising the application and getting kind of rapid insight as to how do I set up the code in the first place so that I can create a unit test that's gonna test and validate the code. Um, this is something which is usually that first hurdle. Now. As I, as I said a moment ago, this isn't universal. You know, some teams, you know, you might find that you have several folks which are, you know, they're just, you know, testing experts, right? And they're they're able to knock out the unit tests, no problems. Um, however, the trouble is that your team as a whole, not everybody's at the same level um, of expertise. Also, you're going to find that folks come into a code base and there's, you know, you've got new hires into the team, they have to try and get a handle on how this piece of code is connected to everything else. So what we've done uh, within the JTest product that I mentioned a moment ago, is we've introduced capability called the Unit Test Assistant. The Unit Test Assistant gives me the ability to be able to streamline this process. And the first area that it helps me with streamlining the process is through the use of what we call one-click guided test creation. So what we're doing here is JTest, through the use of our patented algorithms, is able to inspect the code that you're trying to test and understand its relationships with the rest of the code base, making it more, uh, making it easier to create an initial test case which has instantiated the object, instantiated associated mocks and it can guide you through the process of creating assertions, but also cre um, managing and building those mocks around the unit test itself. So this is kind of the, one of the key focuses of JTest, and this is actually part of our new architecture for JTest in JTest 10.3. Um, and in, what the second component really you know, talks to how do I scale this? How do I, kind of go beyond an individual class. So I can see that Unit Test Assistant gives me the ability to help by analyzing an individual class, analyzing a method, creating a test for that method. But you know what, that's gonna just take me a lot of time to create all the unit tests that I need to create, especially when I'm kind of walking into that bedroom of messy clothes where I don't have you know, uh, you know, I, 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 I don't have the time to kind of put everything away. I need something that can give me a jump start. So what we've done here again inside of the unit tester system is we've taken that same functionality which we use to do the guided creation on a per test case basis and applied heuristics to it to help you with creating your initial set of tests, a particular part of the code base. So what we're doing here is we're doing two things. We're leveraging test case parameterization, where we can store the data either within the tests or externally. 
um, as well as bulk creation where I can actually create the tests across an entire package or an entire project within the IDE. So at this point, I've got a, re a reasonable set of unit tests. I'm starting to grow my unit testing practice. And then actually another problem appears that not many people actually realize. And the, the problem is, as you grow your unit testing suite, you're gonna have to spend time to maintain the unit testing suite. You know, you modify the code, you need to modify the tests. And sometimes it's not quite obvious what the impact of the changes that you've made to the code have against the tests themselves. Also, as I'm building my test suites, what will often happen is you'll find that all of a sudden you have some tests which seem to randomly fail on my build server, but when I run them locally on my desktop, they work just fine. And that's because your tests have become no longer truly isolated. They're no longer true unit tests. There's some test that maybe sets the system property or uh, leaves a file on the file system that your secondary test is impacted by. This kind of test instability is very hard to track down as your test suite grows. So this is the third area where we've added capabilities into Unit Test Assistant, which is all about how we can use the runtime analysis of your tests to go beyond simple code coverage and start to provide you insight as to how you can maintain the tests by identifying instabilities, but also how you can uncover potential mocking misuse. So as you evolve your code, you actually need to evolve your mocks too. So maybe that change in the code impacted a test that you didn't realize because that other test was using uh, that code instead of via a mocking framework. Now, I'm not gonna go through these in, in any more detail today. Really, the focus of today's meeting and uh, today's webinar is to give you that high-level overview so you know kind of what technologies and techniques are available to you as you're trying to build end-to-end -end quality around your Java application. We have done uh, previous webinars on Unit Test Assistant. There's actually a blog post that I'll direct you to at the end of today's session. Um, and in fact, actually, we've just released uh, the, the beta, the first milestone beta release of uh, unit of the next version of Unit Test Assistant, and that's available uh, via our customer portal. So if you're an existing customer, please feel free to check that out or read the forums. Um, so, so the whole point of UTA is to reduce the time that it takes to create your JUnit test suite but also re reduce the learning curve so that you can scale a unit testing practice across your organization. Um, and you know, that's really what addresses that uh, first layer within the testing part of the pyramid. But let's talk about the, the higher level uh, piece next and talk about how we can start to minimize our dependency upon late cycle UI driven tests and how we can in instead start to more focus on uh, the highly automated UI-centric testing. So um, as you look at your applications, um, they're getting more and more complex, as I said, to start with. Um, as I said, also microservices kind of adds more complexity into the mix. The question is, how do I test this application? Well, often, um, you know, folks will actually focus on uh, testing one uh, path through the uh, application, focus on testing uh, kind of a web layer, um, and then say, okay, now I've finished with testing the web, now let me go ahead and test the, uh, the API or the mobile layer, um, and, you know, kind of I need to get some level of visibility so I understand how all of those backend systems are being touched as part of this. But really, this is actually a, a, a broken thought process. What we need to be thinking about instead is how do I actually test each of these different channels through the application in concert with each other? So here, this is where Parasoft SOA tests can help. 
SOA test is actually independent of the underlying technology that's being used. So while we're focusing on Java today, SOA test can test your mainframe backend. If you have a, an MQ service, for example, that's being exposed there, it could uh, test your .NET application that's using WCF. The point here is, that we're, we're focused on an automate first or an API first level testing approach. Um, when we were looking at the testing pyramid, you know, we, I, I mentioned that most people have an ice cream cone rather than a pyramid. And what most people start to do is they start to focus on how can I push that ice cream cone down? How can I kind of take my UI tests that I'm doing and make them automated? The trouble is all you end up with then is an ice cream cone with a cherry on the top. So really what you need to do is you need to be focusing bottom up. So this is where we focus SOA test first. So we say, look, let's test the APIs. The APIs are the core business logic. Then let's take that interaction with the APIs and start using those interactions with the other channels of the application taking data from my API and leveraging it through the web interface or vice versa, validating the uh, the data in the backend system so I can get true visibility to understand the interactions with those backend dependencies so that I can create a true end-to-end -end test touching different components but getting validation at different, po uh, different parts in the sequence. And this is the key area that SOA test can help me with testing those interface layers. So at the top of the pyramid, I've got kind of a SOA test being used to be able to uh, you know, create um, API level tests, but also be able to do automation of uh, UI interactions with the UI layer, um, and then that foundation of unit tests. But the question, the next question is, okay, how can I take these tests and take the testing pyramid and optimize it. You know, I've got a lot of tests now. Um, you've got to think about, okay, where do I invest time from the point of view of my testing? Um, I need to think about how can I rerun them as much as possible. And as I'm getting a whole bunch of data from, from this testing practice and this testing process, how can I make sure that I'm focusing on the right data? So let's focus on the, the first point here, test early and test often, okay? So how can I take these tests and how can I just, you know, basically rerun them as part of my continuous integration, my continuous pipeline? Well, unit tests are typically in their nature already available for continuous testing. Um, normally what you would do is you would be leveraging frameworks like Mokito or PowerMock to isolate that code from uh, its external dependencies. But as I get higher up the pyramid, that becomes a bigger challenge. So if we revert back to our, our testing slide here, you know, we've got all of these tests, but our problem now for it to be able to run these tests continuously sits on the right-hand side, not the left-hand side. I've got these external dependencies that I need to somehow put some control over them. Um, the world of microservices and Docker gives me the ability to start standing up these external dependencies potentially within the cloud, but what about if I need to control the behavior of that external dependency? So you're gonna run into a number of different challenges as I try to do a, kind of the complete end-to-end -end testing of my application. I'm gonna run into systems where I've got an unavailable external dependency. It's a third party. Uh, maybe there's a transaction fee associated with it. Maybe that external party's test infrastructure that I use is down when I'm doing my testing, um, or maybe it negatively impacts my test results, so I can't always trust the data that's coming from my build system. Um, I could also have uh, uncontrollable behavior. So, you know, even in the world of microservices, um, where I have an internal service, which I have full control over its deployment, maybe I don't have the ability to control its behavior. Maybe I want it to return a particular data set, but for make it return that data set, I have to do a, 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 a way too cumbersome uh, setup of test data or associated test infrastructure. Agile roadblocks where I'm stuck waiting for another team to finish. Um, so, you know, we're all 
sprinting together towards our end goal. We're all working on highly dependent infrastructure. Certainly, we have that challenge at Parasoft. We have uh, web-based interfaces as well as desktop tools as well as server components. And all these things, you know, when we're adding new functionality, it's, there's a coordination effort here. There's a dance. So by using service virtualization, I could actually emulate those backend dependencies. And then the last one is performance testing. You know, we we often hear the the term shift left, um, and you know that that's uh, that's probably uh, a, a little bit of today, but you know it could be a whole webinar in itself. But being able to take uh, test uh, the concept of performance testing and shifting that left so that I'm doing it earlier in my software development process so I can uncover performance issues is a key component or a key message around how we can accelerate quality and accelerate the identification of these problems. However, I'm constrained because that external dependency, I can't stress test my application because my external dependency is constrained by the resources that are available there. Um, maybe I even have a performance scenario that I can't emulate because it's outside of a normal working behavior um, and I need to be able to emulate a really, really slow response time to be able to validate the SLA of my system and how it runs under a poor, a poor performance situation from an external dependency. Well, all of these can be actually addressed with service virtualization. So here's where the Parasoft virtualized product comes into play. Parasoft Virtualize enables me to be able to emulate different characteristics of my backend dependencies, both functional as well as data-driven, as well as those performance characteristics, so I can set boundaries as they associated with my service level agreements. We can then tie both the SOA test and Virtualize together through the use of our test data platform that gives us the ability to package everything up within an environment. This environment-based approach to testing gives me full control of my test environment at an individual level, but also gives me the ability to reuse that same template as part of my continuous integration or my continuous pipeline. Taking that template and then using it, stamping it out for different types of testing, maybe I've got different swim lanes or I'm doing parallel testing efforts, I want to be able to dynamically reconfigure my test environment for different uh, functional data or performance characteristics, and then be able to aggregate all of that together into one centralized dashboard. So using service virtualization in conjunction with the API testing gives me the ability to fully control my test environment and be able to run not just one scenario, but multiple scenarios as part of my uh, continuous testing initiative. So the, we, we've got our tests, we're running our API tests earlier because that's kind of our, our, our usual bottleneck. Um, now the next challenge is how do I blend my testing techniques together? So, you know, the pyramid is the blueprint. However, you know, you've got to make an assessment as to what type of testing is going to be best to validate which business requirement. Um, and this is where you really need traceability um, back to both the business requirements and the code that's been tested. So this is actually where Parasoft DTP can help. Um, Parasoft DTP is our reporting and analytics uh, platform. And it's quite simply, think about dashboarding and reports on steroids. Here, what we're able to do is aggregate data from across the SDLC and really provide some very unique insight into what's going on within the code base. So for example, um, if I'm trying to understand what's going on within my different testing practices. So through the use of DTP, and the JTest coverage agent, we're able to start segmenting your different types of coverage so that you understand what, type, what levels of code coverage you're getting within your code base based upon the different testing practices from the pyramid. So in this particular scenario, we've got uh, almost 63% coverage from our unit tests, almost 30 from functional, and then we have a number of manual scenarios that is giving us around about 23% coverage from the manual scenarios. 
Now, those numbers together are interesting, but really what you want to know is that combined number. So through the use of DTP's unique analytics, we're able to both separate those out, but also map them together, uh, taking into account the overlapping in coverage, so that we know, for example, and you can see my demonstration example here, I've got uh, 229 unit tests, 113 uh, functional tests, and 12 manuals. They've all been aggregated together, and uh, uh, 354 total tests. And this coverage information is, is not just simply an individual uh, kind of number. It's not just a macro level number. It is actually granular. So I can look at an individual part of my code base. I can see what the code coverage is for that code base for each, each of the methods. I get, I can see what coverage is going on within uh, the code to the use of coverage markers. But I can also see what tests have executed that part of the code base. This is actually a unique thing that you need to think about. How can I figure out how to expand my tests? Where do I need to be able to focus? Well, that's what the coverage is going to give you. But then the next question is, is there anything that I could reuse? Um, so is there some test that I could take that already exists that could help me create, increase the code coverage for this part of the code? How am I currently testing it? Am I testing it with manual tests? Maybe I should look at automating those. Maybe there's some unit tests that I can take and expand. So being able to get that visibility um, back to the code that you're testing at the different layers of the pyramid is actually very important to get an overall view as to how well you're testing or how complete you're testing. However, it's not the only number. What you also want to think about is how well am I testing as it relates to my user stories. So here uh, we've got a, a correlation of the, my testing artifacts with the requirements and user stories that are sat within JIRA. So here I can see that I've got a number of uh, tests, a number of stories that actually have failed tests. So I've got seven failed tests here and drilling into this gives me the ability to be able to mine the data um, and understand, okay, which, which stories have the failures, kind of linking back to the original system of record, so which would be JIRA in this case, and getting an overview of how many test failures and passes I've got. And we can also correlate other quality data with that too, such as static analysis or uh, you know, kind of code review process as well. So the ability to be able to say, okay, let's see which um, which, which uh, requirements um, you know have uh, tests. In fact, actually, I could go ahead here and just look at uh, all of the requirements here. But I'm going to filter the data to say, let me look at the tests. Let me look at uh, requirements that don't have any tests. So I actually have a couple of requirements here that don't have tests. So maybe that would give me a focus as to say, okay, this is where I need to focus on increasing my overall test coverage. So being able to focus on the coverage of the tests helps me understand how I can blend the different techniques together so that I can take an, a, 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 a decision as to how to maximize my return on investment. Does it make sense to increase unit uh, code coverage for unit tests in a certain area if I'm already doing AP order fully automated API tests that are running as part of my continuous integration? If I'm covering tests with just exploratory testing or my manual testing efforts, maybe I need to consider if those tests that are, are being done manually are actually doing valuable manual testing, such as exploratory or UX testing, or if they're really just doing a manual test that really should be automated with a test for later da uh, lower down on the pyramid. And then the last thing is, okay, so we've got a solid set of tests. We're testing early. We're testing often. Uh, we're blending the techniques together, but that's a lot of data. I mean, you've got a lot of information coming. You know, we've, we've, you know, not even including the the code analysis data that we're getting from from the automated static analysis. How can I focus so that I can focus on the right data? Focus on the data that's going to give me value, rather than just looking at this mountain of, of information. Now, 
the trick here is, and a, and a lot of people kind of miss this point. So the trick here is you've got to think about quality and quantifying the quality slightly differently. So if you think about how, how people normally think about, um, you know, looking at my test failures, um, and I'll use Sonar Cube as an example. If I'm looking at how I'm looking at my static analysis results or my test failures or my code coverage within Sonar Cube, I'm looking at a particular point in time. You know, I'm, I'm doing my test and it's aggregating the data for that day. However, as we move into a continuous world where you've got the rapid um, uh, delivery cycles, you know, you've got a million bills that are happening a day. You know, depending on how your organization is structured, you could have any one commit from any developer spins up a completely independent build. The question becomes, you know, not, not where am I at at a particular point of time for the bills as a whole. What I'm interested in is, where am I at for the individual builds? Is a particular build got, um, you know, passing from a, a unit testing perspective? Does it have acceptable level of risk when it comes to code analysis? Does the code, what does the code coverage look like for a specific build? And also, when you start doing manual testing and things like that, your build is, is you have the flip problem. You're, when you're doing manual testing, to be able to run your UX testing and your exploratory testing and get valuable data, that build lasts a long time versus the lots of, uh, lots of incremental builds. So you need to be able to not look at a point in time, but look at the build. And more importantly, look at what's changed between the builds. By focusing on what's changed between the builds, you can start asking yourself the question about what problems are being introduced, what challenges am I facing, what, uh, what's caused a uh, unit test failure, and looking at that change rather than having to look at the overarching uh, code base. So, for example, if we just step back into uh, the dashboard, what we can see is a number of ways of being able to look at how the code base has changed. So the first might be actually to say, okay, let's take a, a granular look um, and see what has changed within the code base from the point of view of my files between two builds. And you know, normally you would maybe identify a, a baseline that might be at the beginning of your sprint and you're focused on the work that's changed over the course of that sprint. You would want to see, okay, what's happened within the code base? Um, have I introduced new static analysis violations? So these, uh, this file here is actually marked that it is, uh, has actually, it's a modified file and that it actually has new static analysis violations. How can I see that information? Can I see what that, uh, what that violation is? And then, you know, can I go ahead and comment back to somebody and say, you know, please remove um, test code from the code base, for example, right? And then say, okay, I'm going to go ahead and sign this to John um, and start uh, some kind of review process. So not necessarily to replace an existing code review uh, tool that you might have, but more to augment that code review process to help you understand the changes in the code, but also the changes in the data. So I could uh, filter my view and say, okay, only show me the files that have new violations. So I can focus down on the code base as a whole and say, okay, as my team are working on the changes, have we introduced any new static analysis violations? Have we any introduced any new uh, test failures, for example? The second area where I might want to start focusing on the changes in the code is how can I potentially use all of this data to my advantage? How can I use this data to do kind of streamline my process with more advanced analytics. And this is really where the development testing platform really shines. Um, and we actually have uh, a couple of blog articles around these topics, uh, two out currently and one actually coming. Um, but the first would be around change-based testing. So given that I know what files have changed within my code base, which we just looked at, and given that I know what tests 
touch those files, which was the first thing we showed within DTP, I can look at the intersection of those two things. By looking at the intersection of those two things and analyzing the same differences between the builds, I can identify that I have a number of tests that need to be re-executed. These might be uh, UI-driven uh, manual testing, or they might be automated API tests that I have to leave into a later stage because I can't use service virtualization to shift left everything. But what it's gonna help me do is prioritize my test plan so that I can effectively target which test suites and which tests need to be executed. The second part um, of that type of analytics is what we call uh, risky code changes. So here, the same 10 files that have been changed within the code base, what I can do is I can take the data that we've been aggregating and perform a multivariant analysis to give me an, a level of assessment of the risk associated with that file, because that file has changed, so therefore that's where my risk is, my risk is in change. Software doesn't usually change its behavior um, without me making some kind of change, unless we're talking about AI. Um, but what I'm doing here is I'm saying these 10 files represent the risk, and I've, qu I've classified them according to how well they've been tested, so the ones to the right being poorly tested, and how well they've been architected or structured. So the higher, the closer to the top, the, the poorer that they're structured. And then the size of the bubble associated with file represents the amount of work that's still to be done to bring that piece of code in compliance. So we can see over here that I've got a high risk piece of code, but if I go ahead and drill down into that guy and I look at the details, I can see that actually it has no severity one violations, there's no test failures, so it's actually not too, too bad. Um, it's, it's not very well constructed um, and it doesn't have good code coverage. So I might want to start looking at, okay, how do I want to increase the level of code coverage associated with that code base? Um, and you know, how do I want, you know, how do I want to bring it in the, uh, back in alignment? Uh, conversely, if I look at this guy over here with a big green bubble, um, he actually has uh, four test failures, so I might want to go ahead and address those. Um, but generally speaking, his code coverage is above an acceptable level in this scenario, um, and his maintainability is actually reasonably well scored. So I can use these as metrics, and I can customize them depending on my own development practices and prioritize um, how I want to address those. The last thing I'll talk about around change here is actually talking about the change in, from the point of view of code coverage. So at the beginning, uh, when we were looking at DTP, we looked at the overall code coverage for my code base, and it's a little over 67%. Um, and if I'm looking at that number and I've got a certain threshold in mind, and maybe if I looked at that number over time, let's actually see uh, what that coverage number looks like over time. Let's just go ahead and look at that. So coverage over time. Um, so, you know, it's actually better than it was. It's not as good as it was at the, fir the first build in my demo data set, but it's better than it was last time. So maybe I'm going, you know, I'm doing better. Um, but when we start to look at it in a more granular way, I can, and I take change into account, I can see that, well, while my overall coverage of the code base is close to 70%, the actual coverage on the modified code, the parts of the code base that we've been changing, is actually closer to 50%. So really, this probably indicates that I need to spend some time and actually focus on testing these, um, you know, the, the 28 lines of code which have not been tested. So here, what I'm saying is I modified 62 lines of code. Out of those 62 lines of code, I've tested 34 of them. The remaining 28 indicate or show risk for me. I should focus on creating new tests there, or maybe, you know, once I've, maybe once I've addressed my four um, uh, tests that need to be re-executed, maybe that number will go up. But I still need to make sure that I'm testing the code that's changing or um, is either new or being modified. The, the types of analytics that we can do there based upon all of the data that's been aggregated become very powerful. 
So we can look at the changes in the code base, not just the files, but the data. Um, we can do scoring around how stable the test suite is. We didn't go into that today. Uh, I wanted to kind of keep us focused on our time perspective. Um, but then you can do optimization of the test suites. Uh, we can do validation as to where you should be focusing for creating new tests, as well as what parts of the Kobe represent a higher level of risk that need to be focused on to uh, kind of uh, to, to reduce the overall risk associated with that build or that release. So there's a lot of information today, um, and I really didn't go into any of it in in deep deep detail. Um, as I said, I'm going to forward, I'm going to point you at some other additional points, but let me summarize these as to five steps. Step one is to build a solid foundation of unit tests, and that's really where PowerSoft JTest and the unit test assistant comes in and shines. Gives you the ability to really make unit testing more accessible for the entire organization and streamline the underlying process. Step two is to avoid the reliance on late cycle brittle UI testing and focus on an automate first. So don't think about taking something that you're doing manually and then figuring out how to automate it. Flip that around. Think about how what you're developing and how you create an automated test first rather than going the other way around. And that's where SOA test comes in. Understanding your complete test coverage, and that's not just code coverage, but it is a code coverage in conjunction with traceability to user stories. Certainly DTP is the thing that does that correlation. JTS is the thing that gives me the code coverage numbers and allows me to do that granular reporting of the data to DTP. Fourth step, shift left. So as I've built my API tests, look at which of those API tests I could do earlier in the process if I could remove the dependencies or simulate the dependencies of my backend systems. You're not going to take every test from the testing pyramid and shift it left. 90%, 99% of your unit tests should be all, uh, always leveraged during continuous, but your API tests might have to wait until you've gone to a uh, to a, some kind of staging environment with more infrastructure ready. However, you should be able to shift left a significant portion of those and use them in earlier stages of the, of the uh, development process. And service virtualization is what enables that to decoupling. And then the last thing, is this advanced analytics that we showed with DTP. Being able to look at the data on a per build basis, being able to go into the details and perform actions and workflows around those details and be able to configure that ecosystem specifically to do the analytics as it relates to your development process is key to getting the true, realizing the true or the potential of uh, the, the continuous testing process. Okay, so that was a lot of talking. Um, I'm going to pause now and switch to questions, um, but I'm going to leave you with two takeaways. Um, the first is uh, I talked a lot about uh, Parasort Virtualize and how that can be used to disconnect or decouple yourself. Um, we have a community edition available uh, version of, of uh, uh, Virtualize that's available um, for free. Um, and this is designed specifically around uh, REST and SOAP services. It's uh, for individual developers and testers to use on your local environment. Um, and then also our unit tester system. So the URL here will take you to the unit test assistant landing page. We also have a blog article around unit tester system, which talks about its core capabilities, but also we have some other blogs and articles around how to do spring testing or testing of your spring web, web MVC applications. Okay, with that being said, I'm gonna now switch to questions. Um, so feel free to um, answer, or post them in there. Okay, da, 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 da. okay. so uh, one question is, can the unit test assistant be used with SOA test? So the unit test assistant is specifically focused around uh, Java code. So as you're, it's, it's really the, they, can they be used together? It's kind of it. The, the short answer is you really wouldn't use them together because uh, UTA is focused on Java and SOA test is focused on a more, uh, on the API layer. Um, so, Yes, but I don't see when that would when, when you would actually do that. So, the, so I would probably say 
if you're using SOATest for testing in APIs and you're developing the APIs in Java, I would use both of the tools. Both of them cover two different things. Um, using them together um, is, is not quite the, the, quite the use model. Um, a question about BDD and Cucumber. Um, so, uh, so the question is, um, you know, does SOATest support uh, BDD? So the short answer to that question is yes. Um, there's actually uh, a GitHub project uh, where we have posted the BDD Cucumber uh, interfaces, and actually we do reference them on the forum. So I'm actually going to point you to the forum as well. Um, so here is actually where we have all of the, uh, you know, so if you have additional questions around products, please please, please feel free to enter them in here. So BDD. Okay, so here's actually BDD tests and SOA tests. So this is where it talks about our SOA test Cucumber project that's inside of GitHub. Um, BDD is interesting um, because your, uh, you know, BDD has the benefit of BDD is is in its ability to communicate or document individual test scenarios to a whole variety, a much larger audience. The hidden cost of BDD is the development of glue code or the stub defs. Um, this is actually uh, one of the things that we address with this uh, with this project that's in GitHub, um, where you can seamlessly use SOA test for development of your glue code or your stub defs, and then leveraging those from your Cucumber script. So it's a, it's a really nice intersection of the two technologies. Um, okay, I think we're actually almost at time, but it looks like we have a couple more questions. So let me just look at these really quickly. Um, okay, uh, okay, yeah, so let, let's just pick out these last two. So um, uh, what about .NET? Um, so actually, uh, the Parasoft, uh, we have a .NET product called uh, .test and a, a CC++ product called CC++ test. Um, and these two products do very similar things to JTest for, for the .NET and CC++ worlds. So on the .NET side, um, it is focused on static analysis and code coverage. On the C++ test side, it's focused on static analysis, code coverage, and uh, test creation in a similar way to JTest. All of that data is aggregated seamlessly into uh, DTP. So when I'm looking at a dashboard, I can aggregate data from SOA test, from J test, from the different language tools, all together into one central uh, dashboard and report. And then the advanced analytics can kind of kick off across the, the code bases um, uniformly. Uh, oh, and actually around .NET, one other thing would be WCF being uh, an API protocol that SOA test supports for doing API testing. Um, and then the last question is around uh, microservices, um, asking, can I go into a little bit more detail? Um, microservices is a much bigger topic, um, so we will actually be covering that in a future webinar, um, and we have some blog posts and what have you uh, kind of in the pipe coming around that. But there are really two types of microservices strategy that we see, orchestration and uh, choreography. Um, and you know, the, there are different patterns that you leverage service virtualization and API testing for in those, in those two different uh, uh, kind of deployment models. Um, what I will say is kind of uh, microservices isn't for everybody. Um, it isn't silver bullet. There's certainly some applications that microservices introduces too much complexity, so it doesn't make sense to do. Um, but uh, yeah, as I said, that's a, a much bigger topic, but uh, it's worthwhile pointing out that there are two different architectures and you can use the products, uh, SOA test and virtualize kind of uh, to support kind of the acceleration of continuous testing for those types of architecture. Okay, I think that covers the majority of the questions. So uh, thank you very much again, uh, happy holidays, and we look forward to seeing you on another Parasoft webinar in the future.